Good evening and welcome to another segment of In the Word at Bear Creek United Methodist Church. It's Wednesday, June the 10th. We're glad that you've joined us for our third session of the Parables of Jesus. In our first week, we visited and discussed the parable of the sower and the soils. We challenged ourselves to think about where were we of the four? Were, the, were we the receptive soil or were we one of the three non-receptive? And then last week we talked about the two ways, the two paths, the two gates, the two doors of Luke, and finally the two builders. Challenged ourselves to think about where do we build our house? On rock or on sand? Tonight, we're going to discuss two twin sets of parables. The first being the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven. And following that, the twin parables of the pearl and the hidden treasure. So we're glad you joined us. I hope you enjoy our session tonight. Let's begin tonight with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather here tonight to listen. To listen to your word as delivered by your son to the crowds and disciples years ago when he walked among us. But also delivered to each and every one of us today. Open our hearts. Clear our minds that those words will fall on receptive soil and that we will be caused to bear fruit by their understanding and application in our lives. We're in the midst of difficult times, Lord. They're affecting all of us in one way or another. Some not as hard as others, but we are all feeling an impact. We pray, Lord, that you will gather us together this evening. Use the words of your Son to lead us through these times. In the name of your Son, the Christ, our salvation. Amen. As we mentioned earlier tonight, we're going to study two twin sets of parables. The first, the mustard seed and the leaven. Second one, the be the pearl and the hidden treasure. Both sets of these twin parables found in Matthew we'll study this evening. Um, and all four are about the kingdom of heaven. They're also about two other significant realities for Christians and followers of Jesus. And that is the power of the divine and our responsibility as humans. So let's begin with the parable of the mustard seed as we find in the 13th chapter of Matthew, the 31st through the 32nd verses, where in the NRSV we read, He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it's grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. The parable of the mustard seed can be found in all three synoptic gospels. It was originally written in Mark in the fourth chapter, the 30th through the 32nd verses, and then followed by Luke, where we find it in the 13th chapter, the 18th through the 19th verses. And finally, Matthew bases his account primarily on the narrative that's found in Luke. To understand this parable, we must First, recognize that a mustard plant is an annual herb whose small seed, which is around 20 millimeters or a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, can produce a plant that's normally from two to six feet tall, sometimes uh, reaching nine to ten feet. Um, now, it doesn't produce a tree of any kind. It is a shrub. However, the tree motif in uh, the parable 
um, doesn't come from the fact that the mustard seed grows into a tree, but it really reflects more than likely the imperial tree that we find in study of empires or in the imagery of the apocalyptic literature or in in the case of scripture uh, the coming kingdom of god as we see in psalms also in daniel uh, and in ezekiel so it remains in in scripture uh, even though mustard seeds don't really grow into trees uh, as the final result in this parable of the growth of a mustard seed. The challenging feature is that the future tree-like glory is the continuity with the present um, size of the gospel, or in this case, the smallness and the ordinary, ordinariness of a mustard seed. The presence of the kingdom and the hope for kingdom in Jesus, his works, his disciples, it's no more uh, obvious than a garden herb. But the kingdom will come and God's power and glory nevertheless will grow. And as long as... We have a king who operates in meekness, as in Jesus, rides a donkey instead of a war horse. Uh, then his kingdom can be represented and symbolized by something as simple as a mustard seed that will grow into a great tree. Second half of our twin parable of the mustard seed and the leaven is found in the 13th chapter of Matthew in the 33rd verse where we read he told them another parable the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with the three measures of flour until all of it was leavened the parable of the leaven the yeast this parable is about a narrative about the act of a specific woman, not a general analogy of the relationship between yeast and the kingdom. The, orig the original parable of Jesus had three surprising features. First, it was a positive use of yeast, which is almost always a symbol that has been used for corruption in Jewish tradition, including other places in the Matthew account. But in this case, it's a positive, and like the mustard plant, it's a juxtaposition of the hope of the kingdom of God. Number two, the quantity of flour that was leavened is surprising as well. Three measures. Three measures is about 10 gallons of leaven, which would make enough bread to feed probably 100 to 150 people. Uh, like the ending of the parable of the sower, this parable is a picture of surprising extravagance. Just as there's um, some reminder of the early parts of Genesis, there might also be some reminder of the 18th chapter of Genesis where Sarah prepared three measures of flour at a, as a banquet for she and Abraham's heavenly visitors. The ending of the story pictures the banquet extravagance of the biblical world. And the focus of the parable is not the process of development as Christianity spreads through the world. What we're focusing on here is, as we are in the other seed parables, about the extravagance of, the grandeur of, the glory of the coming kingdom. And the third thing that's surprising about this parable is um, 
the verb used um, for placing the yeast in the flour. It says it was hidden. Um, at least King James Version and the Revised Standard Version doesn't say that in the uh, NRSV or the NIV, but if you look at um, the King James or the New King James, uh, you'll see that and you'll see that then it connects on to uh, other portions of Matthew, particularly the 13th chapter. And therefore, as we think about leaven, uh, we anticipate that we're going to place this or knead this bread. Um, but in the case of the parable, there's no action necessary of the woman. The kingdom comes about because of the leaven and not the fact that she did anything with it other than she measured it up. The kingdom is uh, hidden. It's silent. It's um, going to be, according to Matthew, this unbelievable reality, this unbelievable thing in the future. Right? And this is important to Matthew as he looks at this um, because it means for him that the kingdom of heaven is hidden to all of those people who are around but it's not hidden to the religious lead uh, to the disciples who Jesus is providing this parable to in his discussions so for Matthew the king's coming he's been appointed he's present in the community he's talking to his disciples right but no one understands other than he and they what will come and what will be of the new kingdom. The main point in the seed parables is the contrast between the littleness of the means and the largeness of the end. Technically, leaven is not a seed. However, it's like seed in that it is small and it is potent. Seed parables is a convenient title for these twin parables, even though uh, they're not both seeds. Historically, Jesus taught here that his little ministry would be glorious in its outcome. The contrast in both these parables is the smallness of the agent, the seed or the leaven. The gospel is in its most measurable way small. Think about for a moment how it measures up to the great philosophies and ideologies of history. Doesn't it seem minuscule in comparison? Think about the philosophies of Platonism or Marxism intellectually. And even still, our experience teaches that over the long haul, the story of Jesus moves men and women intellectually, delivers meanings to them spiritually and emotionally, and sends them into mission as a vocation in a way that compares with all the great philosophies. Del Bruner, in his commentary on Matthew, states, we need not be ashamed of the smallness of Jesus, his story, and his ethic. For while it is characteristic of all seeds to be small, it's also their characteristic to be alive. Jesus' story, the gospel, and Jesus' ethic, the gospel commands, are alive with potency and enough people in the church to be in the fact trees of shelter loaves of food for needy people all over the world. As Christians, as disciples, we have to be careful to let the gospel be the gospel. We have to be careful that we don't try to change it to make it something greater than it appears to be. It is in its smallest that makes it relevant for everyone. It is that smallness that's 
that is understood and transforms itself into greatness. Jerome painted a graphic picture of the gospel. The scripture's gospel, he said, is shallow enough for babes to wade in and never drown, and yet deep enough for scholars to swim in and never touch bottom. In other words, there's no need to make the gospel any more than it is for, it is all that it needs to be for all of us. This comes to the amazing thing that I find of scripture in general and the gospel specifically. Every day that I pick it up and read it, it speaks to me in a different way. Written for us in four accounts and very few pages covering the life of the Christ in very few words, but providing meaning, understanding, and guidance to each and every one of us in every situation we find ourselves in. The amount of bread that's produced in the parable of the leaven is really large. It's about 39 liters. Uh, as we said earlier, that's enough to feed 100, 150 people or 40, 50 people for several days. The point of the parable is the same as in the parable of the mustard seed. It's not that the entire world will be converted but that the power of the divine will have enormous effect on the world. Remember what we said about the sower. The path is narrow. Very few travel it. Or in the soils, only one out of four bears fruit. It's the message of the mustard seed and the leaven, however, that for the few... The power of the divine will result in enormous changes. The fruit that is born is great. Or as in the parable of the two builders we studied last week, the enormity of the change is reflected in the hearer and the doer. These two parables, the parable of the mustard seed and the, the parable of the leaven, Ask the hearer to have confidence in the gospel. The gospel goes out as a seed, little but alive, and it comes back with big things like food and shade and shelter. We may be distrusted to, or tempted to distrust the smallness of the gospel against all the great philosophies that are out there. We may try to compare the gospel to what the world thinks we should be. We can look at all of these in their vastness, their grandeur, their apparent greatness, and begin to choose them first. But the reality is that the gospel has stood through all the philosophies all the ideologies, and all the worldly peer pressure. Jerome maybe is the most elegant of the church fathers on this truth of the little becoming the great. He says this, The preaching of the gospel is the least of all the teachings. At first glance, there seems to be no real truth in this teaching that proclaims a dead Christ and the scandal of the cross. Compare the teaching with the systems of the philosophers, with their books, with the splendor of their elegance, with their fine style, and you will see how much smaller the seed of the sower of the gospel is than all the other seeds. But these others, when they have grown, show no vigor, no life, no vitality. They're flabby and faded. The whole batch grows into potted plants and into growths that are quickly wither and die. But this preaching, which seems so small in the beginning when it has been sown either in the believing soul or in the whole world, does not blossom into a potted plant. 
grows up into a tree so that the birds of the heavens come and dwell in its branches. So we've come to that time now where we um, reflect and I have a couple questions for you based on the uh, first set of parables that we've studied tonight. And the first question is, do you think or do you let the philosophies of the world pressures of your perceived identity get in the way of hearing the gospel? Secondly, we're we're experiencing really difficult times where the messages that are reaching our ears are often confusing and conflicted. Are we focusing on the Word of God? Hearing and doing? We're going to move now to our second twin set of parables. The parable of the pearl and the parable of the hidden treasure. And as we look at these two, we're going to look at them together uh, as, as opposed to separately like we did the mustard seed and the, and the leaven because they are very similar and yet they are very different. So let's read these parables from uh, Matthew, the 13th chapter, the 44 through the 46 verses, as we find in the New Revised Standard Version. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid, then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. As we're studying Matthew's account tonight of these parables, uh, it's apparent that he intends for these two parables to be interpreted together. Um, the treasure and the pearl as they follow each other one right after the other in scripture. And they do have common features. The case of um, each, they're a very, very brief vignette um, of a crucial situation, but we don't get any details that allow us to evaluate them and determine how realistic are the stories. But in light of that, we should be careful that we don't try to fill in the gaps using our imagination, using our thoughts and our religious uh, ideologies, uh, our beliefs of piety. Uh, but we should instead concentrate on what the parable does in fact portray. Now, the second common feature is central to the meaning of each of these parables and that is that the protagonist goes sells everything for the sake of one thing in the case of the farmer it's the hidden treasure in case of the merchant it's that one pearl it's the action of as i said the farmer the plowman depending on which version you read and the merchant the movement of the story as a whole can be compared with the kingdom of God for the kingdom is like neither the treasure nor the merchant but in each case somehow it's like the story as a whole in each case the protagonist acts with the single-minded response of being pure in heart the two parables are also different the plowman is emphasized uh, for doing his regular work he's not looking for anything special he's not expecting anything special 
and he comes upon this treasure in the field by accident. On the other hand, the merchant is actively seeking. He's looking for that pearl. He knows what he's looking for. And even though he knows what he's looking for and he's been searching for it, he finds something that is beyond his expectations. And for us, each of these, the farmer, the plowman, the merchant, and the way they find their treasure uh, says to us that the kingdom can become real to us in either way. When we are not looking for it, when we are looking for it. Reminds me a little of the of um, the story of Lee Strobel and his desire to go out and prove God didn't exist and in doing so gets enamored with the kingdom. It's not what he was looking for. And yet it came on him hard. So the second thing that's different about these two parables is that for the plowman, his joy is emphasized but because he is very, very excited about the treasure that he's found. On the other hand, the merchant doesn't show joy in the same way. It doesn't mean that the merchant selling everything in order to obtain his pearl was joyless. But it does mean that joy is not the main point of his parable. What the merchant did, though, may not have measured up to everyone's understanding of common sense. What did he do? He found the pearl he wanted. He sold everything that had to buy it. So you might not agree personally that that's what you would do, but there's no doubt that what he did was totally within the legal bounds, totally within moral grounds, whereas in the plowman or the farmer, you can't necessarily say the same thing. We may question whether he was legally or morally correct in reburying the treasure until he could go get enough money to buy the land so that he could keep the treasure instead of telling the landowner that he had found a treasure there. Right? If you were to go historically and look at the time that Jesus is giving these words to his disciples. Within Roman law, that would have been illegal for him to do what he did. So in the story of the pearl, there's no moral or legal question at all, but still a surprising and provocative action in the fact that he took everything he had to buy the one pearl. Now, in the first century Mediterranean world, the pearl was often a symbol of the highest good, very similar to what we in Western culture uh, use diamonds as a symbol of. The leading point I, I want us to know in, this, in these parables is the joy of the gospel. Each of the two men are carried away by their joy. They express it in different ways, but there's still an underlying joy in both. The farmer, the businessman, changed their life completely. They sold everything they had and bought 
the new precious reality, the hidden treasure and the pearl. If you want to expand on that, you want to apply that to us. Joy is our engine of change. We could say that joy is the engine of sacrifice. But if you look at the parables, neither the farmer nor the businessman thinks he's making a sacrifice by selling everything that he has because of the treasure. The treasure was the key. And so selling everything else to achieve the treasure was not a sacrifice to the farmer and to the merchant. It was smart. It was joy. In Colossians, in the second chapter of the third verse, Paul proclaims, that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus Christ. If that's the case, it's with great joy that we discover the Christ, just as the farmer discovered the hidden treasure and the merchant discovered the pearl. That discovery of the Christ has moved men and women all over the world in all ages to great things and to life-changing decisions. So the moral of the parables is clear. We should be preaching the gospel. And the negative moral is just as clear. It's not telling to make sacrifices that causes people to make sacrifices. People don't do God's law because it was preached to them. They do God's law after they've heard of the treasure that's the word of God. The treasure that is is Jesus Christ. Del Bruner gives the example of the Ten Commandments. He says, See how the Ten Commandments begin with joy. I am the Lord your God who has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, as we read in Exodus, the 20th chapter, the second verse. And then Bruner says the commandments that follow are not joyless duties anymore, but joyful responses to the treasure of God delivering them out of Egypt. As a teacher, we want to get everyone moving on their walk. We challenge them to understand the laws and the prophets and the words of Jesus. And we often focus on the must of Christianity to the detriment of our walk. Bruner states, what we need is a season of stories of Jesus where we hear facts before orders, joy before sacrifice, discovery before decisions, gospel before the law, beatitudes before commands. And when Jesus is found then, believers carried away by joy almost without being told to do so will sell everything to get the treasure. In our parables tonight, no one tells the farmer or the merchant to do anything. The treasurer, the treasure tells everything. Unfortunately for us, not everybody sells. If we look at the soils, only one out of four. But that one sells all he has for the joy, the discovery of the treasure. That one hears and does. That one has discovered the Christ. The path to the kingdom and sells all they have for the joy of possessing it. It's the joy of the discovery of the treasure that leads to the following of commands that leads us to the eternal life with God. 
the relation of the earlier twin parables of the mustard seed and the leaven to the present twin parables of the treasure and the pearl is the relation between seed parables that teach the power of the divine gift and all its seeming littleness on the one hand and these parables that teach the joy of the divine gift and consequent responsibility of ourselves, human beings, on the other. The seed parables, like Paul, stress the prior power of the divine. These parables, like Matthew, stress the subsequent responsibility of ourselves as human beings to hear the word of God, to act on the word of God. So as we conclude our study of the parables tonight, let me ask you these questions. Have you experienced the joy of the discovery of Jesus? What was the result of the joy of that discovery? I'm glad you joined us tonight for another session of the parables of Jesus in our weekly segment of In the Word at Bear Creek United Methodist Church. I've enjoyed having you here. I hope that you have um, taken a new look, a new light of these parables. And as you go forth this week, I challenge you to let something as small as a mustard seed, something as strong as the gospel, be that thing that empowers you to grow as great as the plant of the mustard seed. Something that empowers you to bring home uh, the food and the sh shadow and all of the gifts for those people that are in need. That we take what we've got, that we take what we've received, and we give that to others. I also challenge you then to. Find your treasure. Seek Christ. Listen to his words. Hear them. Do them. And when you've discovered that treasure, sell all the things that get in the way of you creating and having an eternal life with God. So before we go this week, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather here this evening. And first and foremost, we thank you that you are here for us to discover. That if we reach out, if we look, we will find you because you are always here. We ask that you guide us, you strengthen us. And through these difficult times that we're in, that you open our hearts and our minds to your word so that we will hear and we will do. In the name of your Son, the Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Again, I'm glad you joined us. I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday as we continue our study of the parables of Jesus. Have a good evening. God bless.